Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining me for another Sprinkler Talk. Uh, this is episode number 26, and we're looking at the extent of sprinkler protection. So uh, extent of sprinkler protection means in which areas are we going to sprinkler protect, uh, and which areas are we not going to sprinkler protect? Uh, that's, that's the topic for today's presentation. Now, you might not be surprised to see uh, this kind of a quote here. Um, and, and, and definitely, you know, this is the default kind of setting for sprinklers. So if you're surprised uh, that there is um, a, present, a whole presentation on not sprinkler protecting the whole building, um, then this will give you some confidence in terms of, you know, this is uh, the, not the norm, if you like. The normal situation is to sprinkler protect all areas of a building. So, for example, this is um, taken from section five of BSDN 12845, where it says a building is where a building is to be sprinkler protected. All areas of that building or of a communicated building shall be sprinkler protected. OK, so that is the kind of the, the, the default standpoint of sprinklers. It's an all or nothing kind of affair. Um, if we're not going to sprinkle protect the, the whole building, then OK, um, we can do some passive fire protection. We can make sure there's good escape routes. We can obviously fit uh, smoke detectors, etc. We can have fire extinguishers. You know, there are lots of other things that we can do. But if we're going to go down the sprinkler protection route, then we want to protect the whole of the building. Um, and this is to do with um, the way in which sprinklers are designed, the way in which they operate. Um, as we've spoken about in previous presentations, you know, they are very effective, uh, very good at what they do, um, but they're designed to tackle the fire in its early stages. Um, as soon as the temp ceiling temperature reaches the activation point, um, we'd say it's normally 68 degrees, then we're discharging you know, quite a lot of water and we're hitting the fire hard um, at its early stages, and we are looking to uh, control, contain, suppress, and hopefully extinguish at the same time. Sprinkler systems are not designed to take on a large and established fire. It's just going to overwhelm the system. We're going to get too many heads operating. The water's going to run out. It's not, not going to do the job well. So, as I keep saying, you know, the, the default position is that we sprinkler protect the whole building because we don't want a fire to kind of catch hold in one area, which is not sprinkler protected, grow um, to, a, to a large extent, and then move into areas which are sprinkler protected because they just won't be able to cope um, with that large fire. Um, and there's a similar quote here taken from uh, 9251, so the um, domestic and residential standard, where it says sprinkler protection should be provided in all parts of the premises. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I didn't actually look in uh, 16925. I'm sure there is a very similar statement in 16925 as well, which is the European uh, standard for uh, residential and domestic sprinklers. Uh, what we do have, though, is, is um, a section 5.4 in 9251, which is talking about some exceptions. Um, so it says sprinkler protection should be provided in all parts of the premises. However, unless required by a fire strategy or risk assessment, the following may be excluded. So it is giving you um, a, few, um, a few areas which do not have to be sprinkler protected. So what we've got here on the list. We've got bathrooms, um, small bathrooms, so say less than five square meters. Uh, cupboards, again, only small cupboards, less than two square meters. Attached buildings such as garages, um, but then importantly, you know, not all garages without direct access from the protecting building, from protected building, sorry. Uh, crawl spaces, ceiling voids, external balconies, uninhabited loft or roof voids. Um, so basically areas where we're not expecting um, a fire to start um, because you know, it is generally unoccupied, there's, there's, there's not a lot in there. Um, so uh, yeah, ceiling voids, um, crawl spaces, uh, uninhabited loft or roof voids, etc. are not required to be sprinkler protected. Um, so bathrooms and cupboards are often left 
uh, not sprinkler protected as well. Bathrooms, I mean, obviously they are essentially wet rooms. Uh, there's lots of um, tiles and uh, white goods in there. There's not a great deal to catch fire in a bathroom. Um, but remember, these are these, these may be excluded. So I think for, for some people, they would automatically um, take away sprinkler protection in all these areas. Um, but I would say that you do need to consider um, you know, the type of people that are living here. Um, so, for example, if it's um, maybe a, a secure premises, um, maybe you've got people with learning difficulties, um, you know, some sort of sheltered housing. Um, if, if the person, uh, for example, is it maybe it's a kind of council premises and the person's a hoarder uh, and is storing, you know, loads and loads of stuff in their house, you know, all of this would, would, would come into play in terms of whether or not these areas would be excluded. Um, so with the, with the example of a bathroom, for example, um, if you're storing a whole load of, you know, if you've got rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls of toilet paper in there, then, you know, you're creating a fire load. Um, so, yeah, for me, that would that could be a problem. So, yeah, the following may be excluded. Um, there's a similar statement here in uh, 16925. Uh, so, th yeah, there, there's our statement. In fact, yeah, where a building is to be protected by a residential sprinkler system, all areas of that building or of a communicating building shall be protected by a residential sprinkler system. So, again, it's given a very similar statement to say that, generally speaking, we want all areas to be protected, except in the following cases and accepted by the authority. So, again, we've got toilets or bathrooms, fire square meters. We've got a little bit more detail in this standard saying with a non combustible lining and which are not prepared for electrical machinery, such as washing machines or dryers. So again, they're just making that distinction that uh, if your bathroom is, is also kind of like a utility room and you've got other, other equipment in there, um, then you, know, you should continue to sprinkle protect. Uh, un com sorry, compartmented, normally unoccupied areas or roof voids not containing electrical machinery and equipped with suitable fire detection. So again, they have gone into a little, little bit more detail with these, these other areas um, and yeah, saying that you know, they have to be compartmented and they have to have suitable fire detection within them. Um, normally unoccupied attics, yeah, only where type one systems are installed. So again, they're, they're making a distinction between the different, um, different kind of uh, applications of, of the system. So a type one system is basically a domestic houses so where you've got you know, residential blocks of flats, for example, you wouldn't be allowed to, to not sprinkler protect the uh, unoccupied attics, whereas if you're a domestic house, then you would be. Uh, then we have something called shadow areas. Uh, it sounds quite exciting, doesn't it? A shadow area uh, where the cumulative dry area does not exceed 1.4 square meters per sprinkler. So I'm not going to go into that to, uh, in this uh, episode. Um, that is coming up in sprinkler talk number 30. So sprinkler talk number 30 is um, looking at um, residential sprinklers part three. Um, so on that presentation, I will explain all and tell you what shadow areas are and how we can calculate the cumulative dry area. But for now, let's just leave that um, as, a, as you know, just a, a point. Uh, section 5.3 uh, refers to areas of, of limited non-residential occupancy, uh, which again I'll go through in uh, sprinkler talk number 30, but that, that's why it's saying, because um, the points there, A, B, C and D are essentially 5.2, and 5.3 is referring to these areas of non-residential occupancy. So again, we have some, we have some uh, what I'm calling permitted exceptions here to um, sprinkler protection. Under the uh, industrial and commercial rules, so we're looking at um, the LPCB rules here. So remember, that's kind of made of several different parts. So we have the British Standard 12845. We have the technical bulletins. And uh, one of these technical bulletins, TB206, um, is all to do with passive fire protection of sprinkler buildings and and covers these um, areas which do not have to be sprinkler protected. And again, we've got a little quote here from that technical bulletin. 
Again, very, very similar kind of language. All areas of a building or communicating building shall be sprinkler protected. Okay, and so that, that's our default setting. We're going to sprinkler protect everywhere except in the cases indicated below. Okay, so again, we've got a couple of, uh, of exceptions here. And uh, there's a few notes there to say to, it replaces uh, some various clauses in the EN, uh, in the VSOE. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the job of the technical bulletins. They give some more information. And on occasion, they actually overwrite uh, what the British standard says. Uh, so we, first of all, we have necessary exceptions. So my sort of definition of a necessary exception um, is basically where sprinklers are going to do more harm than good. Um, so obviously we, we are discharging water. Not everything likes having water discharged onto it. So you're probably familiar with um, an oil fire. So if you've got like a, a chip pan fire, what you don't want to do is put water onto it. Um, because the, the water um, quickly kind of boils and it'll cause the oil to spit. It'll come out of the pan um, and then it'll spread the fire, this hot oil then that's on fire to other areas of the kitchen and you'll make the fire a whole lot bigger. Um, so it's, it's not a good idea to discharge water to fight fire in all situations. Um, the vast majority of cases um, we are dealing with class A fires where water is extremely effective in tackling fire, but there are going to be a few exceptions where you say discharging water is going to do more harm than good. And TB 206.4.2.2 is going to give you some, um, some details of, of those kind of uh, exceptions. So silos or bins containing substances which expand on water. Um, I've actually I looked into that a little bit uh, in the past and found that um, something to do with um, the manufacture of contact lenses is an example of this, um, where substances going to, are going to expand. Um, and I think the idea of, of the expansion is it then starts to block, um, maybe block exits and um, get in the way of evacuating the building. Uh, things uh, to do with like in industrial furnaces and kilns, salt baths, again, similar kind of thing. We're going to have the water um, producing a lot of steam or, you know, making a, a, a spreading the fire out. Uh, that's not going to be good. Um, and number three, you say nice in general, uh, basically what I'm saying, areas, rooms or places where water discharge may present hazard. So again, if it's not going to actually do any good, and in fact, if it's going to do some, some harm, then that would be a necessary exception. We also then have permitted exceptions. This is very similar to the residential standards we looked at earlier, where it's an option. You don't have to put um, sprinklers into these areas, as long as it is agreed and signed off by the relevant bodies. So um, some examples of this then. Uh, washrooms and toilets. So again, same kind of principle. Uh, there's not a great deal to catch fire um, in most washrooms and toilets, and therefore they can um, not have sprinkler protection fitted. Uh, but importantly, they're put not cloak rooms. So again, if we've got a whole load of coats uh, being stored uh, in the room, then that is a fire. That is a fire low. That's a fire risk. So again, we would want sprinkler protection in that area. And again, we've got a little bit there. Again, we've got to use non-combustible materials and not storing combustible materials. Uh, enclosed staircases, below stair headings, etc. Vertical shafts uh, are all on this list. Uh, rooms protected by other automatic fire suppression systems. So inert gas powder, for example. Um, water mist could be a, another example. Um, so things that have got other, other processes going on. Uh, wet processes such as the wet end of paper making machines. So I suppose, yeah, if, if the room's already wet, uh, then making it wetter is um, yeah, not going to make any, any impact. And then rooms or compartments containing electrical power distribution apparatus, such as switch gear, uh, transformers, and used for no other purpose. So this is um, 
well, I suppose washrooms and toilets are very common uh, to not be sprinkler protected. Enclosed staircases and, and um, vertical shafts, etc., very common to not be protected. And then I guess the next one is the uh, is this one about the electrical rooms. So it is quite key that they're used for no other purpose. Okay, so we've got to kind of have all of this equipment in a, in a separate room. Um, so server rooms uh, come under the, come under this, um, and say this examples here: electrical power distribution, switch gear, etc. Um, this little note about communicating buildings. Um, so communicating buildings are buildings which are kind of linked to the main building. Um, so it might be that they are they, they share a wall. That would definitely be a communicating building. Or it might be it's just connected uh, in some way. Uh, a communicating building, again, is important for the sprinklers because if the communicating building is not sprinkler protected, then again, if that catches fire, then the fire may then well spread um, across to the the, root, the, uh, the building that is sprinkler protected. And again, in that instance, the sprinkler system is unlikely to be able to do any good because it's taking on you know a, a full uh, full sized fire uh, and not a fire in its early stages. So yeah, in the majority of cases, um, you need some fire resistance between non sprinklered buildings or areas and sprinklered buildings and areas to stop um, it, 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 it's not to stop the um, the sprinkler area getting into the non sprinkled area it's stopping a fire from the non sprinkled area getting into the sprinkled area so that, that's that's why that fire resistance there is required um, yeah and that was just a note for me to to talk about the principle of what we're actually doing here which are already which are already done earlier on um, so talking about sprinklers taking on a fire in its early stages so talking about permitted exceptions um, and looking at uh, at other other options really so rooms protected by other automatic fire suppression systems or of these electrical rooms you don't Let's say you, you know, you're a bit worried about water discharge in those rooms. What can you do? So options, you can fully sprinkler protect it anyway. Okay. So sprinklers are very reliable. Um, sprinkler bulbs are very reliable. Um, if it's installed correctly, it's built to last. So you could take the, to the decision that um, you've got, say, this kind of um, little server room, say, in an office. Um, but you're going to sprinkler protect it anyway, and you know, say a lot of people do. Um, or you can decide not to sprinkler protect uh, that room. So then you'll have a partially uh, sprinkler protected um, building, and you'll say you're using your permitted exception. So say again, that is that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, again, we can all agree that it'd be better um, if it was fully sprinkler protected. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you can choose to do it as long as that, that area falls under the permitted exceptions. Uh, another option um, would be to use gaseous systems. So again, remember on that list there, if, as long as it's protected by an alternative um, fire suppression system, then that's fine. So we can use a, a gaseous system such as this, or you say that there are other options, but uh, let's just take gaseous systems for example. Um, now the problem with gaseous systems is that they are quite, um, well, they're quite um, sort of application specific. Um, so you're going to have to have some gas bottles here. They're going to have to be stored somewhere. Um, you're going to have to run new pipe work. Um, you've got restrictions on the, on the ventilation of that room because the gas is only going to be um, efficient um, if we can sort of contain all the gas within that one room. Um, the, the system could have to be tested and checked and signed off. Uh, we might have to worry about access into that room um, because some of the uh, some of the gas systems are kind of poisonous for human contact. Uh, again, uh, usually above a, a certain concentration. Um, so again, that can be a problem in terms of making sure that there's nobody in the room uh, when the gas is discharged. So it's often a lot more expensive um, than a sprinkler system. But when I say that, I mean, if you've already got a sprinkler system in the building, 
then adding some more heads into a room is very, very cheap. Obviously, a sprinkler system in general has, has got a cost to it, uh, but if you've already got one in the building, then say adding um, protection to another room, cost is very, very low. Uh, if you want to install a gaseous system as part of that building, then again, the costs are going to be high. Um, back in, what, when was it? Sprinkler Talk 8, um, we talked about a different types of sprinkler um, installations, and one of these was a pre-action sprinkler system. So on the face of it, you know, th this sounds good. Okay, it's a double knock system. We need the sprinkler heads to operate, and we need the uh, fire detection to initiate in order for water to be discharged. So, say, if, if you're worried about accidental water discharge um, into your server room, for example, where it's going to cause a lot of damage in a short period of time, um, then the pre-action sounds good um, as, a, as a, an option. There are a couple of issues uh, with this. Um, one is the fact that um, you know you, you'd need to run, um, you need to buy you know a whole alarm valve, um, so a, a whole new installation. You'd have to run pipe work um, to this area. So again, it really depends on how much you've got to protect. If you've got a lot of areas to protect, then it may well be worth it. If you've just got a few server rooms dotted around, um, then again, the cost is going to be high to install a whole um, pre-action system in order to get there. You've also got um, a slight issue in terms of um, life safety. If your building's also been designated for life safety, then you know, they, they may not like using a pre-action uh, system. They certainly prefer uh, a standard wet system uh, to be used. Uh, another option is Gemini. So this is a product which um, is supplied um, by Project Fire. So this is, this is again one of our products. Uh, and this is like a pre-action sprinkler system, but it is compacted down to a single um, unit. So again, I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail today, except to say that you know that this is what it this is what it's for. It is for protecting these areas where we're we're concerned about accidental water discharge. Um, we've only got a few rooms, so using um, a gaseous system or a pre-action system is going to be uh, prohibitively expensive. Um, so we could just actually use these, these units here uh, to provide double knock protection within a small area. So this, this unit here has two sprinkler heads. Both of the heads need to activate in order for water to be discharged. If just a single head is, is activated, then we get an alarm, but we don't get any water discharge. If you want to find out more, uh, you can look at uh, our website, um, www.projectfireproducts.co.uk, um, forward slash products, forward slash Gemini. I've also done some videos on Gemini in, in the past, and, and they're on YouTube. There's also uh, what we call a simple show on our website as well, which is like a cartoon uh, version um, explaining what Gemini is all about. Uh, but yet yeah, there, there's a, another slide there showing you that the fact that say both heads need to be activated in order for water to be discharged. And the water is discharged out of a single head, by the way. And of course, it doesn't matter which head goes first, uh, it works either way. And it's all mechanical in, in operation as well, so it doesn't rely, um, the electrics are there for, for the signalling, um, but yeah, electrics are not required in order for the for the actual operation of the system. So, so in a, in, a, in a genuine fire, um, we don't need to rely on electrical supply. You know, it will activate, it will discharge water. There's a picture of one installed there in a in a server room application. Um, we can link uh, various Gemini heads together. So again, we can have um, well loads uh, over 100, I think, of these heads linked together. Um, uh, back to a single panel, um, and the, the monitoring panel will alert to a fault. So either one head is operated, or you know the, the communication's been lost, or something like that. Uh, that will trigger a fault on the monitoring panel. Uh, Gemini can also be connected to our zone check addressable product again, which is something that um, I'll probably do a, a whole sort of sprinkler talk presentation on. Um, but yeah, I have mentioned it in the past, this idea 
of uh, linking units together on an addressable loop back to a central controller. So again, yeah, our zone check addressable panel can receive signals from uh, Gemini heads. And that's it, that's a little rundown of um, extent of sprinkler protection. Um, so again, focusing really on, on areas where sprinkler protection is not required. It's always recommended, um, unless you happen to be um, in one of these areas where it's a necessary exception. So where, where water discharge is going to do more harm than good, uh, then you wouldn't be installing sprinklers. But uh, everywhere else, sprinklers would be recommended to be installed in the whole of the premises. Um, but there are some uh, permitted exceptions where you wouldn't necessarily have to. And I also went through some options um, where you can provide alternative methods of, of sprinkler protection, including our Gemini product, which you say is like a, a pre-action sprinkler head. So next week, um, we're looking at modular sprinkler construction. So this idea of modular construction is one that is, uh, is very popular um, in, in construction in general. Um, the idea of making things off-site, uh, bringing them in, saving time, uh, saving labour on site, uh, more efficient production, better quality. Uh, so you say that that's you know nothing that um, the Project Fire or nothing that the sprinkler industry have kind of um, invented that kind of um, way of doing things. Um, but I'm going to be talking about um, sprinkler specific construction um, in, in this kind of modular. Uh, modular world. So yeah, I hope you can join me again next week for next episode of Sprinkler Talk, which is uh, going to be about modular sprinkler construction. Okay, I hope you have a good day, and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.